All right, welcome to X Garage. Wah, 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 wah. Well, that was a terrible way to begin the uh, but, show. But, yeah. but, but here we are. Here we are. Anyways. X Garage. <laughs> yeah, we made it. <laughs> here we are. Hey, this is where we dive into worldviews using the Christian worldview. Christian as, worldview. Yeah. Yes. Um, cool. The so crazy let's start. world of worldviews with the Christian worldview, right? Yes. Crazy, yeah, that's it. Crazy world. Yeah. Crazy that's, world. That's just dive in, pedal around for a little bit. Then get out, dry off. Cool. That's right. Got to have a good, good towel for that. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Cool. So today we are talking about rabbinic or Orthodox Judaism. Um, so this will be a a blast. We've all kind of been looking at uh, their their thoughts, their objections to Christianity, and uh, yeah, looking to have a good conversation. So as always, if you see something that we missed or you'd like us to address something, leave it in the comments. We love interaction. Uh, even if you uh, disagree with us, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, cool. Well, guys, let's dive in. I think let's just start with um, there are 13 articles of faith, and I believe the person that wrote them down, maybe I'm incorrect, is Mal- Malmedez. Medidas or something. Um, I'm going to find his name at some point. But, uh, oh, yeah, my Monides. My Monides. There we go. My um, Monides? Yeah, that's that's probably it. I was listening to British people talk about him, so they were probably saying his name differently. <laughs> um, so, anyway, let's read through these. So these are the 13 articles of faith. Number one is belief in the existence of the creator who is perfect in every manner of existence and is the primary cause of all that exists. Two, the belief in God's absolute and unparalleled unparalleled unity. Three, the belief in God's non-corporeality. Did I say that word right? Okay. Corporality. Nor, nor, yeah. yeah, corporality, thank you. Uh, know that he'll be affected by any physical occurrences such as movement or rest or dwelling. Four, the belief in God's eternity. Five, the imperative to worship God exclusively and no foreign false gods. The belief that God communicates with man through prophecy. The, seven, the belief in the primus, primacy of the prophecy of Moses, our teacher. Eight, the belief in divine origins of Torah. Nine, the belief in the immutability of the Torah. Ten, the belief in God's omniscience and providence. Eleven, the belief in divine reward and retribution. Twelve, the belief in the arrival of Messiah and the Messianic era. Thirteen, the belief in the resurrection of the dead. Cool. So there we go. That's that outlines the 13 articles of faith for Orthodox uh, Judaism. Yeah. So Maonides Maonides was uh was a Pharisee, I guess, because he believes in the resurrection of the dead, right? If I'm getting that right. Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. He wouldn't be a Sadducee. 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 So at least, um, at least he believes in that, yes. <laughs> y- yeah. And it seems like that that's the move of what I'm seeing in a lot of the what I was reading cursory reading of most of the Jewish teachings today and comments that are commentaries tend to have the pharisaic tradition where they're taking all of the old testament they're not the sadducees had just the law of moses the five books and so they really tried they didn't have as much in terms of resurrection um and uh they were not as deterministic or that's a terrible phrasing the the pharisees believed in in sovereign election um the sadducees did not they were more of the you might say the pelagians of the of the the jewish tradition um and uh but what's interesting is the guy that i'll be will be working from here in a, a moment seems to have a bit of a the jewish jewish tradition tends to have that sadducee kind of way about them where they emphasize uh the ability of humanity even post eden to obey torah uh, which we'll get into which is not 
I don't think it, it tends to side more with the Sadducees and I think with a strong Pharisaic tradition. The Pharisees, I think, would want to say more about uh, God's enablement and grace and mm-hmm. in the Old mm-hmm. Testament. It's true. Cool. There's a, there's like a big shift towards less God's sovereignty and more man's volition. Yeah. Yeah. So Heath, it looks like you had a um, a document that you uh, d- took some time to respond to. Um, it was called the the real Messiah: A Jewish Response to Missionaries, I believe. That's right. The so real should... Messiah? The question mark. Do you want to do you want to just jump in there? Let's do it, man. Okay. Dive so, right in. So I, I came across a good towel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna have to have uh, <laughs> robes that are not our own, the robes of Christ, to yeah. preserve our minds from. Anyway, uh, I don't know where that's going. <laughs> Terrible analogy. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I don't do well with with uh, uh, theological humor. Um, <laughs> so the real Messiah. Yep. In question mark there. Like more like who is the real Messiah? A Jewish response mm-hmm. to missionaries by uh, R. Yeah, uh, Kaplan or Kaplan. Um, I uh, found this through uh, uh, just you actually can find his source through Wikipedia, I believe. But tracing mm-hmm. him out as a figure, he was raised um, really didn't have much of an upbringing in terms of Torah, the law, and Judaism. But he had some family ties there, and but uh, at a young age, he became devout, uh, studied throughout his life uh, to such an extent he actually interpreted the ink. I'm almost positive here; and it could be checked. Uh, is that he he translated all of either the five books of Moses or the whole Old Testament, and has a, a really well known translation, English I believe translation of the law. Uh, and it has really good, I guess, uh, for the their, for the Jewish um, belief system, a good footnoting system, a good commentary notations, everything. So the guy was a, a thinker, and at some level, uh, we could say is a, a voice within their uh, their their understanding of uh, the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament. So that's why I chose him. It wasn't just kind of. Uh, sporadic or like oh here's a here's a guy linked to wikipedia therefore we're gonna no uh he he genuinely has uses the general same same argumentation that you'll find in any jewish commentary say on uh genesis um same arguments same way of reasoning from the texts uh so this just stands as a template of which we're going to get into and uh share uh, basically the invalidity of his argumentation Uh, in support of the Jewish understanding of the Messiah. And on the flip side, reiterate how he uh, either straw mans the Christian, the the biblical New Testament authors, he straw mans their arguments. And and along with that, of course, Christianity, who follows the the Old and New Testament. Uh, And or he's just creating... um, ad hominems and other types of arguments that actually are not even in, aren't even inferential they're not even they're just him stating a, a, an emotional appeal and then moving on so we'll look at that hmm. let's, let's see here let me pull up the document okay so i think one thing that note before we get into is we're going to read his sections on his arguments but the, the big thing to note is overarching thing that he starts off with is just saying the, the Messiah cannot be Jesus for because the, the, the nature of the kingdom would be that when the Messiah came, uh, the Jewish understanding, according to their Jew, Jewish understanding, and that, again, is in agreement with the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time of Christ, is that, Jesus, that the Messiah, when they, he would come, he would establish a rule from Jerusalem, and it would uh, also bless the nations in a geopolitical fashion and and then it would establish this eternal shalom or the earth complete shalom and that's really kaplan's emphasis is that jesus cannot be the messiah because there's not a global peace under torah um, those things can't work like a mustard seed 
Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're we're gonna touch on that. Uh, very good. I shouldn't even. I didn't even think of that uh, uh, passage in Matthew. Actually, it's probably several places. Um, but he says, what's interesting is he first will note in his book, his article slash book, is that everything we know about Jesus, he says, is found in the Gospels. This is quoting him. Everything that we know about him, that is Jesus, is found in the Gospels of the New Testament, a book written by and for the early Christian church. This book, however, was written primarily to further the cause of Christianity, and it was or is therefore impossible to separate the historic person of Jesus from the Christ uh, required by early or uh, yeah, required by early Christian theology. In other words, what's interesting is he first will start off an article and says um, that Jesus is a Jew. He was raised under Torah. And yet he says that the only way to know Jesus is through the Gospels. There's a <laughs> contradiction here, right? Because he, he had just said that the authors of the New Testament, you can't, it's impossible to separate the historic Jesus from the Jesus that these writers are creating. Yet he himself has gone into the Gospels to separate out, well, Jesus was actually a Jew. He did follow Torah, but he wasn't everything else that the apostles said. So first and primarily, I just want to start off by contextualizing that his argument is subjective. It's his hermeneutic of taking what he wants from the New Testament that agrees with his under, his faith mm -hmm. and then rejecting anything else that does not agree with his faith. So he's, so he's not taking the authors consistently, nor is he applying a consistent hermeneutic. Um, and and I, I just want to put that he he writes he yeah he presupposes the authors were writing for early christian church to propagate yet the the authors of the gospels are writing historic accounts of christ mm -hmm. and his life and teaching which is uh it's just fascinating that he uh would call the new testament a christian book mm -hmm. when the authors themselves were jewish people and the early church was primarily Jewish. So yeah. he's from from the onset of his argumentation, he's he's trying to bifurcate a, a a a strange Christian group that has nothing to do with Judaism, when in fact mm. the, the teachings of the New Testament are that Jews saw their Messiah in the person of Christ who resurrected and they followed. So any thoughts on that before we move into the Yeah, questions? I mean I don't I don't mean to be facetious um but when he says there's it's impossible to separate the historical christ from the biblical christ i'd have to say i agree because they're one and the same historical christ christ is historically representative in gospels and so um for him to say that he's like yeah the, the, the reason you're having trouble maybe separating those out or trying to distinguish them is because they're one and the same and there's no way of actually separating that out that makes sense. That's fascinating. Great point. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. It's a good way to go about it. Uh, J Jake, did you have anything on that? No, I think I think that's great. Um, okay. If you if you want to share the screen, um, I also made you host. If you wanted to do that. Okay. Um, I was on my document, not on the book. But let's put the book up. I got actually I chatted you the link. Oh, you did. So I'll just stay on my document. Um, oh yeah, you can check. Well, uh, so, here, we can we can edit this part out maybe. <laughs> uh, you, can, oh, okay. you can you can you can give me the the host abilities back. You have to go, scroll over to oh. my name. Um, oh no, let's not edit this out. Let's leave this for our viewers yeah. so they know that we are <laughs> yeah, they, they, you real. Know. Yeah, <laughs> and not that we don't real already X garage. So, yeah, exactly. Um, sure. And I was trying to be so that. seamless about it. You know, I'll just, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have to share. So, Jacob, do you do you have any more more thoughts on on that idea of the historical Christ and how that that straw man? Uh, it just seems like they're they're taking a, a page of the book of um, liberal scholars that. Uh, mm. You know, when when you're searching for the the historical Jesus, right? You're yeah. you're kind of 
presupposing certain things can't be and so you don't just interpret the text as what it's saying. Um, but I think if they applied that same methodology to their own text and they'd walk away with something very different as well. So it's, it's just it, like I said, an inconsistent hermeneutic method. I have no clue why the uh, screen here has this so large. <laughs> <laughs> but we're just going to scroll down. Um, well, to that first point. Um, let's see. Practical guide to missionary problem. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it starts off just talking about missionaries, Christian missionaries, how they behave and how, how to expect that they're going to behave towards you. And then it tells Jews how to behave towards missionaries. Um, I think at the beginning, he says they're zealots and uh, don't waste yeah. your time arguing with them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, that's the summary of it. So, you Christian missionaries, listen up. Maybe you're coming off a bit too rugged. I don't know. Um, I guess we'll... you rugged cowboy missionary, <laughs> <laughs> you dapper young man, you. Um, yeah, <laughs> here we go. Um, so here he goes. So let's just go in the articles. Um, here he's it is enough to state the these Christian articles faith to see uh, why the Jews have, could not accept them. Uh, taking them one by one, the Jewish viewpoint would be, so here he is, he's responding to um, the Christian perspective, which I think when he lays out the four points of the Christian perspective here, and he, and he really argues that the Christian perspective is grounded in Paul's writings, uh, which again is a silly, just, just I, I, to use more, uh, cordial language it's it's just a fallacious distinction um, mm -hmm. Paul's teachings are all Peter everyone affirmed each other's teachings even Peter says Paul's writings are graphe inspired uh, mm -hmm. authoritative so mm -hmm. just strange stuff he's not really making a genuine attempt and and I think that is because if, if he did make a genuine attempt he would know that he would ultimately have to say the Christian perspective is a is a valid interpretation of Torah and the Old Testament. It's just that he chooses to reject it. Um, so he lays out the four Christian perspectives and they're very, uh, if someone paused our, our video on YouTube when it's, when it's posted, um, you, you can just read through these and see how they're not the real Christian positions. For example, um, one of them states that Israel has no place really in the continuation of God's plan with, with Christianity. That's just false. That's, we're going to get into that. And we'll do that by reading his, his arguments. So the first one is Jesus could not have been the Messiah. Uh, the prophets predicted a world of peace and love after the Messiah's coming. And this certainly does not exist today. Furthermore, any talk of the Messiah as being the son of God is totally unacceptable and, and no in no place do the prophets say that he will be anything more than a remarkable leader teacher. Except in Daniel. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I was going to get at. So I, I'll, yeah, go ahead. What's your guys' thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, just, just first there, there's two things there. Yeah. There's two things there. I just want to know. One is that he, he can't be the Messiah because he did not establish a global reign of peace. And number two, uh, the Messiah is not God incarnate. The Messiah is actually just a great teacher. Uh, I, th I think if you accept Daniel's, uh, the, the son of man, if, if you accept that um, phrase in Daniel as that mm -hmm. being, as that talking about the Messiah, I think you have to conclude that this, this person is divine in origin and that uh, ba basically he, he's more than just a, a, a human, um, mere, just merely than a human, if, if God is, is granting him that kind of glory and honor. Um, and then again, um, as far as establishing world peace, I think it's 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 safe to say that the the gospel working like a mustard seed um, is is sufficient for. Like he he did establish those things, though we're not seeing them happen all at once. Right, I think to 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 bunny off that, if that's what they call it, um, is that in all the texts. 
I think he, again, this is where I think he straw mans even his own positions, that you mm-hmm. can't make such a simplistic reading of the messianic kingdom like that and just say, when Christ comes, it will be global reign of peace. Uh, mm-hmm. and, the, and the reason why I say that it's a simplistic reading is because he knows full well that in those contexts, like Isaiah 65, 17, and then what you're talking about with, with the son of man, is it's not just a peace of among neighbors. It's literally the lion and the lamb laying down together. It's this language of a entire, every fiber of the earth being restored. The, mm-hmm. the new heavens and new earth is the language of Isaiah 65. It's not the, it's not the way things are now. It's literally a recreation of all things, which we see taken up in Revelation 21. One. Mm-hmm. So even if the Messiah was born to in, in the line of David, like Jesus is and still is and reigns currently, let's say he's just naturally born and he reigns in Jerusalem, that, that means he's still subject to death. He's still subject to sin. He's still subject mm-hmm. to all the curses. There is no reversing of the curses. He just leads people according to Torah. But Torah in itself, even under the law, where God's very clear that unless he circumcises their hearts and gives them a new heart, there's no mm-hmm. there's no spiritual life of the Torah in man, and there's no um, no way in which the land of the earth is going to be healed. So it has an eschatological end that's beyond the current conditions. And that's why I think they, he doesn't he doesn't deal with that at all. No, uh, we we only have so many minutes here. I think we have we have uh, eight more minutes in this session. <laughs> Great, you're aware of it. Good. Yeah, we're not raking um, in the millions of dollars as X Garage yet, so we don't we don't pay for extra minutes on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're still looking for sponsors. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so before we so, um, yeah. Just, just does, did that kind of make come out clear? Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there's that. He totally just washes over that fact that he has to deal with the fact that uh, it's going to be a gl- not just global unity, but actually the Messiah is going to rule such that it restores all of creation, um, mm-hmm. which the New Testament authors, in their Jewish interpretation, understanding, following the teaching of Jesus Christ Himself, knew that. that the first coming of Messiah, which is continuing, it was really a continuation of his role, that the first coming, he would heal and draw people's hearts to himself through the promise of Joel, where God would pour out his spirit on all flesh, all flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, that began where God's restoring Adam and f- creating this reconciliation between God and man dwelling in us, which, which the temple foresaw. Uh, the, the glory of the Lord in the temple is now in, the, in us. And then to come will be that glory of the Lord in all of creation restored. And it's a, like you said, Jake, it's a process. It's not a kingdom of mm-hmm. immediacy. Um, there's no way to read the Old Testament in an immediate fashion like that with any, any sense. With the de- deity of Christ, any marks on that? Why he says he can't be, there's no, he said basically there's no passages. Should we, should we, yeah, I think we can handle that in this video. Let's see. Sure, we got, let's about, do it. got about four minutes. Let's go quick. Are you able to pull that up, Heath? Oh, uh, what? No. Well, it's right. It should be right here. Uh, he can't be the son of God. It's mm-hmm. totally unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> in no place, sorry for the sarcasm, in no yeah. place do the prophets say that he will uh, be anything. Any, anything more than a remarkable leader, Jake? I mean, you noted it. The Son of Man is definitely more than a remarkable leader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the end of the story, right there. Is that all the Old Testament text about this coming Messiah is that he's the servant, suffering servant who would bear the sins of his people in Isaiah fifty-three. I mean, no one man can bear the sins of all people. That's just himself under the curses. He, he could bear his own sin. Right. This is a unique son, a second Adam, as Paul interprets in Romans 5, uh, a new Adam for a new creation. There's just no way. All the all the prophecies are looking to this wonderful counselor, everlasting God, Prince of Peace, 
uh, mm -hmm. born of a virgin. I know they don't take that passage as saying she's a, just a young woman and it was a sign of, of historical past, but that again, that's an interpretation that uh, they're missing the Christ who actually was born of a virgin and rose again. So anyway, all the, if we go through all the Old Testament language of this ruler, it's to rule eternally in righteousness. No son of Adam is going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, why, don't, to, to, why don't we just read yeah. the, the Daniel passage really quick? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I, I saw in the night vision and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the agent of days. So this one, like a son of man, came up to uh, God himself and was presented before him. And the son of man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Um, I, don't, I don't know where, where this reference is, but I was, I, when I was talking with uh, or listening to uh, Anthony Rogers, who's been on our show, um, he's pointing out that a lot of uh, pre-Christian Judaism from this passage concluded that God was some something of a binity so that be, because of the language here you'd have to conclude that you know, so God is giving someone else the kind of glory that he alone should occupy hmm. and so that unless this other person was himself divine then then this would would just bring up a bunch of issues Blasphemous uh, issues. Yeah. Right. Um, that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him, speaking of the uh, Son of Man, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So again, the Son of Man, one who's like a Son of Man, has an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think, and, and if we're talking about that, you know, that this guy is a ruler, um, the, um, the Messiah is a ruler. This is speaking of the Messiah. Um, I think it, it just sounds kind of silly to say that, that he was nothing more than, than just a man. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you say then they would all serve him? Yeah. Verse 14. What, in, in chapter 12? Or was it another one? Uh, I'm reading from Daniel 7. 7. Uh, yeah, so I won't, uh, we'll just leave it there. I think, cool. I think you're right. There's the indications of the Son of Man um, all throughout the last half of Daniel are radical. Yeah. Um, in, in that one, yeah, so. I yep. think what they're they're missing is from the Old Testament from the very beginning is God foreshadowed that uh, through the types and through throughout this uh, progressive revelation began to unfold that He Himself is salvation that yep. Yahweh is salvation cool. and that He would come and dwell with us. Cool. Well, we're gonna end our episode there. Somewhat of a cliffhanger, but I appreciate all of you coming and joining us in X Garage. X Garage. X garage. And...